Welcome to the counter offer. What episode are we up to? 28. 28. I say two articles that he doesn't know. He says two articles that I don't know. Let me get started for this week's exclusive news. Number one, Gen Z homebuyers are flocking to this Utah city in the housing market. Lehigh. I don't know. I don't even know where that is. <laughs> Salt got, Lake City. There you go. I was going to say St. George. And you're a very good traveler of Utah. I have been to Utah many times. Booming real estate market. Listen to this number. Gen Z has made up 22% of the mortgage requests in Salt Lake City, Utah. 22%. Wow. Gen Z. The average what age... Is Gen Z? Uh... I don't know, but they say the average age of Gen Z homebuyers, listen to this, the average age is 22. I don't know where they're getting the money. I don't know how they're getting the money. It might be crypto, but that's crazy. And they listed all of the metropolitan expensive cities, San Francisco, LA, New York, Miami, Chicago, blah, 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 Austin. In all of the cities, top 10 least popular metros for Gen Z buyers, six of the 10 are located in California. <laughs> huh, that's interesting. So Gen Z is not buying, and they mentioned New York City as well. So they're not buying in New York City. They're renting, which is very interesting because either it might be too expensive or they rent in a city and they buy outside of the city, which would be also interesting. What did you experience in the thriving metropolis of Utah? Uh, well, the interesting thing there is it's a very young population. I'm not exactly sure what the average age is in Utah, but it is very, very low. So I guess that doesn't really surprise me. And people start their families a lot earlier. Yep. Uh, and it's affordable. So. If you're not spending all of your money on, you know, hedonistic activities, basically, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, materialism, you know, they're investing. Yeah, they're 22 investing, years old. They're saving up for a home. You know, that's what the prized possession is out there. Yep. So that's good. What do you got for us? Turning unused office space into housing could solve two problems, but it's tricky. Oh, uh, one of the interesting long stats, hallways. Uh, yeah, no, it's very hard. The, the flooring is and there, and thicker. You know, that is a New York City uh, article where you're going to think about all the places that need to convert office into uh, residential, but it's all over the country. You yeah. Know, San Francisco, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, this article was talking about Washington, D.C. Uh, not only does it solve the problem that uh, offices are vacant, but then it also solves the affordable housing. And what they were talking about mainly is that it's very expensive, as we've discussed. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult to repurpose a building without having some sort of extra incentive very or expensive. government support. Yeah. Uh, so it's gonna take some time. And then of course they target New York City on how difficult it is that the government makes it for uh, developers to do that. Yeah. Uh, what's the incentive? Because then, especially if there's no incentive on the affordable housing, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, selling it affordably isn't gonna cover the costs. Yeah. So not only is it a lot of hard work and, you know, takes a lot of money to repurpose these buildings, but then you have to make sure that the juice is worth the squeeze. And the uh, zoning issues and the permitting issues in New York City make these projects almost near impossible. Well, no, they have to do a targeted campaign like they did in the financial district, FIDI. In After 2011, you had all these vacant office buildings, so they had a targeted program that those buildings had gigantic in incentives to go to residential and all a lot of them did you have dozens of buildings down there that either went condo or went rental and they need to do that in midtown i think that's the only well, way the, did they make it affordable was the, it an affordable incentive what was the incentive was it a tax abatement i think what there was, was i think there was it was taxes but also 
the construction loans, I think were, there was just something along the lines because these are massive buildings that got converted, 40 to 50 story office spaces that got converted, so. Because whenever you go down there and you see some of these buildings, the resales are still very high. So that is the problem that they're going to encounter if they keep doing it the way they're doing it is not being able to make it affordable. Yeah. Developers take on these like huge uh, projects and aren't gonna be getting a good payout for it. So one stat I found very interesting was the uh, exemption uh, that right now developers in New York are adjusting after the expiration of tax exemption for builders to include affordable housing. The exemption played a large role in multifamily housing construction in the city. According to the study, 70% of multifamily properties built from 2010 to 2020 took advantage of that tax yeah. uh, incentive, which, yeah. that's interesting. They so, say do a park, affordable housing, something in there. Now, We were talking this, about a, that Gowanus project had 25% affordable housing. Right, and here is a interesting way that they wrapped it up, which I think is uh, was really smart, because if they need government support and they need you know, everybody's gonna be talking about affordable housing. Well, the end was about how building construction produces 11% of carbon emissions, according to the World Green Building Council. It can take up for 80 years for a new energy efficient building to offset its own carbon emissions. So, repurposing a building is almost necessary as opposed to building a new one, tearing it down, building yeah. a new one. It's, you know, very bad for the environment. Yeah. So well, you can also take those commercial buildings down. Yes. If you can't even repurpose it, imagine taking one of those things down. Well, that's, <laughs> that's where crazy. you should, you know, I, that's where I, I read the end of the article and I was like, well, if the governments really want to tackle this idea of climate, that's the new incentive. Yeah. It'll be like a climate incentive, a carbon emissions incentive that you could uh, give to somebody who's repurposing a building as opposed to building new construction. Well, talking about incentives, our governor, I'm not going to say her name because I don't actually know how to say her name. Do you know how to say her name? Hochul? Yeah. I, Is I've it Hochul? I've corrected on that a lot of times, yeah. so I'm not exactly sure. That's embarrassing. <laughs> I do not know her governor how to say her name. But talking about Gowanus, which I was out there yesterday, there was a gigantic pro project that was actually incentivized to do the project because it had affordable housing in it, and it was 25%. It was a 350-unit building. So this is a huge footprint in Gowanus, which is in Brooklyn. And the governor is now allowing, in Gowanus, 421 alternatives. You probably read about this. And 421 is a tax abatement for developers and the 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 debate the tax abatement essentially works as they tax the land, they build the building, but they don't tax it like there was a building, they tax it like the land was still there. So they're really just taxing the land. And it could be 15 years, 30 years, they also have 421B, blah, 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 I won't get into the details. But they just launched, this is, this is actually a very unique um, point, but I also want to bring something a little special, a little button at the end. So they launched this program. It allows certain multifamily developments, talking about multifamily developments, in Gowanus to receive tax abatements like a 421A tax abatement, which expired. So they don't give those out anymore. Under the arrangements, the state would take over the Brooklyn sites hmm. and rent them back to the developers through a long-term ground lease, and the property owners would make payments in lieu of the taxes. So the pilots is what they would call it instead of taxes, and it would be a discount to what they would normally pay. So this is a little like Battery Park City. Battery Park City is all on land leases. And the whole thing is a land lease, and they meet and they discuss what should the taxes go up. The issue is that the taxes are very high now. Wow. Because it was right. built when the World Trade Center was originally built. The original World Trade Center was built. Now you're talking about decades later, the taxes have only gone up. What I am against is that the state is now going to own it before and then lease it back to the developers. So the developers make all their money 
And then the condo that, or the condo board, now is on a land lease to the state. Kind of like, so it's an incentive. Kind of like what, Charles? Communism? <laughs> you're not gonna rent from, you're gonna buy your condo that's on government property owned by them. So it's interesting. I'm not really for it, but Gowanus, there needs to be it's some. It's actually a really amazing neighborhood out there. So yeah. I don't know how they're gonna do it, but it the is whole definitely it. worth checking out because Gowanus is a pretty awesome uh, place that's yep. ripe for development. Uh, Manhattan real retail market is riding tailwinds of a strong tourism and lower asking rents. So Very strong tourism. Yeah, well. I thought people didn't like New York City. Why are they coming to visit? Yeah, I can't believe it. From, uh, <laughs> you go to any comment section. From January to June of this year, asking retail rents were 30% below their 2016 peak. So that's a pretty big uh, drop off the peak. Um, yeah. I can't, the, the whole article kind Say of- Say that, how much? 30%. Retail? Yeah. Wow. Rents are 30% off of the peak. So that's what's driving it. People are seeing that uh, they can get a better deal than it was in 2016. <laughs> so I think tourism is going to push a lot of business into business because restaurants, coffee shops, wine shops, hotels. That's true. They just have to go to the office because that is a big portion of traffic. Well, retail, I'm thinking retail ground Retail benefits floor. from the, I'm not thinking retail yeah. above. I'm well, thinking no retail. Re retail where? Oh, you mean like a big store? Like Century 21? Yeah. There's a, lot, there's a lot here on Broadway that are not like the big spaces. Like Nike? Yeah. Yeah, it would have to be a clothing store or something like that. But like the smaller places, they're doing well. Yeah. Well, that's because now it is more affordable. You know, more affordable because the leases are down. Yep. So people are still willing to spend a lot of money. In fact, they're willing to spend more money on their daily coffee, et cetera. And, uh, $6. Yeah, even more. So that's, you know, where all of a sudden these smaller businesses, these pizza shops, where rent was one of the biggest parts of their uh, expenses, you know, it's becoming more affordable. When you speak about tourism, uh, we had a note that there was 56 million tourists in the first half of this year. Well, the oh, first half of this year? That's what it says. With 56 million tourists in the first half of the year, New York City sales tax revenue in the fiscal year 2023 reached a total of $7.8 billion, up from 15% last year. What uh, are we going to do with that money? <laughs> affordable housing. Uh, so that is, uh, but listen to this. So 56 million tourists so far this year, as you may know, China is, you know, still kind of coming back from COVID. Everybody's a little worried about the Chinese. I think uh, all of the Asian countries, I had a friend that went to Japan and they're still wearing masks. Well, all of them, their economy is not doing as well as they anticipated, you know, slowing, slowing growth. So I found this pretty interesting with the expectation that visitors from China in 2024 could be 70 million. Wow. 70 million to New York City from China. And to New York City. That's a very good point. Uh, <laughs> to the United States. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they're talking about New York City and then they say that. So, okay. Yeah, it would probably got, be the United States. Makes, yeah. it makes a lot more sense. Because <laughs> that would make up half of <laughs> the tourists. That would be so funny. Well, we it, had 56 in the first half and it's 70 million in the well, second half. Well, if it's 56, that would be 112 million in total. You know, if yeah. we expect that number to go up, it could be. It will go up because that's when hey, most people come. Somebody watching and listening, what is this? Is it going to be New York City? Is it going to be? <laughs> yes, we, 70 million. Because we need to look up how much to Chinese tourists come to the United States. I mean, think about it with LA and San Francisco, Miami. Yeah, it's yeah. way more than 70. They go to only major metropolitan areas, they don't go to like a land. Utah? Yeah, they don't, they don't go to a national park. Yeah. Well, uh, could be the bottom of retail. Those are the four articles for this week. I think they're great articles all over the place, which is good. 
And if you have any uh, questions, leave in the comments below. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you see next Wednesday. Articles. Yes, and we will comment on.